Well, amen. Let's all stand together and open our Bibles to the book of James. All right. We're in James. This will be the last sermon for a little while. We're going to come back and revisit James, but we uh, decided we'd go through James chapter one. And uh, the next series after Easter is going to be on uh, fighting the unseen war, the unseen battle, because you need to understand that there's spiritual activity going on all around us. And we're seeing a lot of um, evil that is manifesting itself in these last days before Christ returns. So how do we deal with the, uh, the demonic presence that we are witnessing almost each and every day? And how do we find comfort in the fact that not only are there, there are demons that are attacking us, but the angels of God are protecting us, amen? Aren't you thankful for God's angels this morning? protecting us, God himself protecting us. Well, in James chapter 1, verse 26, we've been in a series called Walking the Word. The title of the message today is, Why Doesn't My Walk Match My Talk? Why doesn't my walk match my talk? In James chapter 1, verse 26, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans. Caring for who? And widows. Caring for who? In their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Let's pray. Father, bless your word as we study it this morning. I pray, Father, that we'll be convicted and motivated to confess our sins to you, to repent of our sin and to live more closely like Jesus than we ever have before. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. James uh, Cameron created a fictional world. See if you know what it comes from. It, it's called Pandora. Anybody know? Yeah, Avatar, right? Avatar. A lot of people say, anybody seen the movie Avatar? You ever seen it? Weren't the colors in that movie beautiful? I mean, they're really just beautiful. And, and in, in this uh, film, you, you watch it and you're just amazed by all of the, the colors that you see. And you're absolutely amazed at all the breathtaking views that are depicted in that particular movie. The interesting thing about that movie is what happens afterwards. Because they report that many people after seeing that movie Avatar left the theaters depressed. Can you imagine? Why were they depressed? Because they walked out into a world that they depicted or they saw was not nearly as beautiful as the world that they had just seen. Pandora. And they walked out into a world that was not nearly as exciting as the movie depicted Pandora to be, and they go out into the world that's not as beautiful, it's not as exciting, and it caused depression for many people. I'm not even joking, it's called PADS, P-A-D-S, post-avatar depression syndrome. When I read that, I have to admit that I chuckled a little bit, and I thought, man, we find anything and everything to be depressed over these days, don't we? Post-avatar depression syndrome pads. You know, here's the truth about us, about human beings. We all yearn for something different. We all desire something brand new, and something beautiful, and we all desire that tree of life, so to speak. Every single person desires that new birth experience, a, a noble brotherhood, many of which are depicted in the movie Avatar. And so people really desire that and they really want that. Now may I ask you something? Shouldn't Christianity have that same kind of effect on people? When people are around us or they gather together in a worship service, shouldn't they be excited about what is going on and, and they see that, you know, there is something better. There is something new. There's something that's different. There's something that's exciting. It's called Christianity. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I see it in God's people. I see it in those who profess to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and it's new and wonderful and exciting and I want what they've got. Shouldn't every one of us depict that 
to this lost and dying world that we are in. Solomon teaches us that eternity is set within the hearts of men. Let me say that again. Solomon says that eternity is set within the hearts of men. What he means by that is somehow intrinsically we know that this isn't all. Those who claim to be atheists always amaze me because something inside of you tells you, if you're honest with yourself, that there's something greater than we are and something beyond what we can see. And they have to kill that in their conscience in order to say, at the end of your life, you just die and turn into dirt and that's all there is to you. Solomon says, we all know deep in our spirit that something more is out there. But what gets in the way of that message? If the church ought to show something different, if when people come here or meet you out on the street or wherever you are in life, maybe someone that's a friend that doesn't know Christ, if the people have that kind of experience with you, then they know that there's got to be something more. But what gets in the way of delivering that message of something new and something exciting to those who are around us? Pay careful attention because what it is, James tells us, impure religion. Boy, religion has done a lot of destruction throughout the centuries, has it not? In the name of religion, we've murdered people. In the name of religion, we have chastised people. In the name of religion, we have done a lot of ungodly thought things. And, and the Bible teaches us that these filthy garments of man-made religion. You see, Christianity, if you don't know this, is not about religion. Christianity is about a relationship. With who? With Christ. Right there it is in the name. Christianity, Christ. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes we are guilty of the epitome of false advertising, claiming to know Jesus, but acting nothing like him. That's false advertising, isn't it? Another false belief is that you can come to church Sunday after Sunday and you can worship Jesus without being like Jesus. You know, there ought to be some effort on the part of every born again believer to be like Jesus. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. And so as we strive to be more and more like Jesus and we come here more like we, more like Jesus than we were the previous Sunday, it ought to make it easier for us to worship him and praise him and honor him. Well, James gives us a a litmus test, if you will. We might ask the question this way, are we worshiping Christ correctly? Are we worshiping Christ the way the Bible bears out we're supposed to worship Christ? Is our religion impure and how do we know whether or not it is? I want to share with you four things very quickly this morning. If you're taking notes, write this down. What is a good explanation of the word religion? What is a good definition or explanation of that word religion? Well, the word is used two different ways in the New Testament. In one case, the word religion is depicted very negatively. You think, well, how so? Remember all of the religious practices that the Pharisees had, right? And and they would use their religion to put others down and to beat others up. And, And so it's depicted in the Bible as being something that is very negative. But also the word religion is depicted in the Bible to depict something very positive. So we have both sides of the same coin. We have religion in one way is depicted negatively, on the other way is depicted positively. And and remember the Apostle Paul used this word religion to describe his life. He talks about what his life was, was like prior to meeting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm worthless, he would say. I was was sailing nowhere. I had no direction in life. I didn't know what life was really all about, is what Paul would say. Prior to becoming a believer, he's saying my life was a wreck. But then I met Christ out on that Damascus road one day. A relationship with Jesus changed everything for the Apostle Paul. James uses that same word to describe 
an outward expression of an inward relationship. You see, if you really are walking with Christ like you should, then it's going to come out in your behavior and in your words and, and, and the way you walk in life. People are going to see that that person's religion is real. It's not phony. It's not fake. But it's something that is real. Do you agree that if we truly know Christ, it ought to make a difference in the way we treat one another? If we truly know Christ, we're going to raise our children differently than a lost person would raise their children. If we truly love Christ, we're going to treat our neighbors differently than a lost person would treat them. If we truly love Christ, how we work for our employers is going to be different than that of a lost person. You see, a relationship with Christ ought to change everything about our life. It ought to permeate everything that we do in life. Religion. So the second thing, what are the signs that our religion is pure? What are the signs that our religion is real to the core and are pure? Look at verse 26. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Ooh, wow, that hits us with a velvet covered brick right in the forehead, doesn't it? Because right here, James is saying how we use our speech is an indicator as to whether or not your religion is real or phony. You know what flawed speech does? It discredits our religion. When we say that we know Jesus, but we use flawed speech, then people wonder, do we really know Jesus? And if we know Jesus, why aren't we acting like Jesus? They begin to ask those questions. Do you remember, do you remember a horrible time in 2015 when a bluebell ice cream was shut down? One of the darkest periods of American history. Here you have a hundred year old company and it's shut down for four long months. What in the world had happened? They had recalled over eight, listen to this, eight million gallons of ice cream they had to recall. Can you imagine the financial loss of recalling eight million gallons of ice cream because of something called listeria? Man, I, I, toward the end there, if they would have made listeria flavored bluebell ice cream, I would have eaten it. <laughs> 10 people got sick over listeria and three people actually died from listeria. Here's what they they do now. If there's any question at all, when they inspect the pipes there at Bluebell Ice Cream, if there's any question at all, they will immediately shut down the line. They'll clean everything inside and out till it's absolutely sparkling, glimmering, spotless. And then they inspect it all over again because they don't want that to ever happen to their company again. Here's what James is teaching us about an unbridled tongue. An unbridled tongue causes all kinds of damage. I can prove it to you. Anybody here ever been hurt by somebody else's tongue? You ever had somebody say something to you that was so ugly and so mean that it cuts you to the core of your being? All of us know what that is like. And James warns us, he said, you've got to bridle your tongue because your tongue can either amplify and build up that religion that you have or it can literally destroy it. An author by the name of Richard Brooks said, a tongue uncontrolled by the speaker is a sign of a heart uncontrolled by the Savior. That's true. You ever said anything you've regretted? And as it's coming out of your mouth, you know that what you're saying is wrong. And you're under conviction even as the words pour off of the end of your lips. Jesus said, it is from the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. What are the sins of the tongue? One of the sins of the tongue would be backbiting. 
being one thing face to face with somebody and then when they turn their back, you're just stabbing them in their back with your words, backbiting. Another sin of the tongue would be lying. Anybody here ever told a lie? Would you raise your hand if you've ever told a lie? If you don't have your hand up, that's one lie. Anybody here ever stolen anything? Would you raise your hand up real high? I just want to know who I'm preaching to this morning, a bunch of liars and thieves. All of us are guilty of those kind of things. Sometimes we steal someone's reputation with our words, right? That's stealing. Sometimes we backbite. Sometimes we lie. We can be double-tongued or we can have a flattering tongue. We don't really mean it. We just are saying it to try to get something for ourselves. It's a flattering tongue. You can have a muttering tongue. Have you ever known someone who has a muttering tongue? There's always always griping about something, just muttering about something under their breath, maybe, maybe out loud, but they're always just muttering about something or maybe someone who has a perverse tongue, a perverse tongue. The sins of the tongue are great. They're mighty. James says true religion recognizes the potential for damage by the tongue. So his advice to us is to bridle the tongue. Anybody here ever own a horse? You know, we used to own a horse. Before we moved here, we had a little horse, a little Welch pony, and you have to put a, a bridle in its mouth, you know, so to get it to go and do what you want it to do. And this is exactly the imagery that James is using right here. He said, you need to put a bridle on your tongue. So just imagine for a moment, your tongue with a great big old bridle on it. He says, you need to control it that way with the help of God. It's like putting a bridle on a horse. You put that bridle on your tongue and then the word of God that you're hiding your hurt begins to govern your, your, your speech when you hide it in your heart. It governs the direction of your speech. Does this ever bother you when you're watching some award show, which I have not watched in a long time because they just have made me sick to my stomach to watch these award shows where some actor or actress will get up there and they've made some kind of a vile, filthy, corrupt movie. And then toward the end when they get their little award for whatever it might be, they say, and I just want to thank God for letting me win this award. You think God had anything to do with that movie? The filthiness of that movie? And yet they will invoke the name of God as though God had something to do with that. There was a woman one time during a, an invitation at a revival service and she'd been guilty of using her tongue incorrectly and, and she came forward and she told her pastor and the pastor knew her well and the pastor knew what kind of woman she was and how she used her speech and she came forward and she said, I just want to lay my tongue on the altar, pastor. And the pastor looked, he said, well, the altar is only about 20 feet long, so lay as much as you can and then start doubling back and stacking up. Some people's tongues are that long, right? We often will justify the use of our tongue when we use it incorrectly. We might say something, well, it's true. Just because it's true doesn't mean you have to repeat it. That's called gossip, right? Just because something is true doesn't mean you have to go around and tell everybody else, did you hear about us? And, and here's what really bothers me, it ought to bother all of us, is when we guise it in as a prayer request, but it's really just gossip. You need to pray for Sister Sally. I heard she was messing around on her husband. Let's pray for her. And that's what people do. They'll use prayer as an excuse to gossip. Well, that's true, Pastor Mark. Or someone might say, well, that's what I thought. I didn't have any evidence of it. I didn't have any proof of it. But, you know, that's what I thought was said or That's what I thought happened. And so you just start talking about it as though you know it was said or that you know it happened. Oh, well, Pastor Mark, I can't help myself. That's just who I am. I just talk. You ever know somebody just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks and they cannot shut their mouth? Some of you thinking, yeah, you, I wish you'd shut up right now. (laughs) We've all known people like that. And And we have a warning. It's found in the the book of Matthew chapter 12. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Do you think God takes our words seriously? He does indeed. Here's the third thing. Speak with a compassionate heart. 
Speak with a compassionate heart. Verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows. Caring for who? In their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Now he says we're supposed to demonstrate caring. When we visit the orphans and widows, I think it says in the King James, when you make a visit or you should visit the orphans and widows or you should show the orphans and widows care right here. And we are encouraged to go visit them to bring encouragement to them. And the Bible is bearing right right here that when you bring encouragement to an orphan or a widow, you are strengthening them as well as yourself because you're practicing a true and pure religion. Real religion will give you a heart. False religion makes you not care about anything or anybody. But if it's real, if it's from God, if it's because of your walk and your relationship with Christ, you're going to care about other people. The, the, uh, the, the things that matter to Jesus ought to matter to us, right? Psalm 68, 5 says, a father of the fatherless, a defender of the widows is God in his holy habitation. Let me read that again because I don't want you to miss it. A father of the fatherless, a defender of the widows is God in his holy habitation. He's a father to the fatherless. He's a defender of those who have been widowed. That's who God is. And I'm supposed to be like him. I'm supposed to try to live a life like God wants me to live. So this care and visiting, the Bible says, really isn't confined to just orphans and widows. It goes broader than that. Orphans represent those who are homeless. And they need protection, don't they? Widows represent those who are helpless and they need provision. And the Bible says you need to help the helpless and provide for those who have no way to be provided for. Listen, one is homeless and the other is helpless. How many ever known someone who's homeless or helpless? We've all known people in those kinds of scenarios. But here's the fact, both of them are hurting. You know what real religion does? It rescues the perishing. Remember that hymn we used to sing? Had that line in there? Rescue the perishing. That's true religion. That's pure religion. The Bible bears out that true religion cares for the dying. Cares for the homeless. They didn't have any Medicare. They didn't have any Medicaid. They didn't have Social Security. They didn't have welfare. There was no social net to catch them when they fell. The best they could hope for if they were an orphan or a widow, the best they could hope for is that someone would come along and enslave them. Can you imagine? The best hope you have is to become a slave? You remember a few weeks ago, I told you about when a woman would have a baby and she would lay the baby at the feet of the father. And if the father reached down and picked up that baby, it meant that he accepted that baby and the baby was welcome into the home. But if that same father were to look down at that same baby and turn his back on that baby and walk away, it meant that that baby was either going to be an orphan or die. Did you know that same kind of thing goes on even today in India? It most certainly does. The widows and they have orphans and they're untouchable. They're not to be ministered to in any way because their religion teaches them that karma has spoken. And you're interfering with karma if you try to help out a widow or an orphan and they are suffering for a reason. So we can't get in the way of that. They're suffering for a purpose. That's not real religion, is it? Come on, do you think that's real religion? They're suffering for a reason. They're suffering for a purpose. So just don't do anything to aid them or help them. Pure religion always shows compassion to those who are hurting. Always. What does the New Testament teach us? Charity begins at home. In 1 Timothy it says, but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The Bible in King James says you're an infidel 
that you don't know Christ if you don't provide for those in your own household. You're worse. An infidel is an unbeliever. You're worse than an unbeliever. Charity is supposed to be supported by the church. In 1 Timothy it says, take care of any widow who has no one else to care for her. But if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. Remember that part, Chelsea. (laughs) There is something, or this is something that pleases God. Now, a true widow, a woman who is truly alone in this world, has placed her hope in God. She prays day and night and night and day, asking God for his help. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead even while she lives. Give these instructions to the church so that no one will be open to criticism. But those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. That's pretty strong language there. So charity begins at home. It's supposed to be supported by the church. And then charity should flow out to the world. In Galatians it says, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. What's it saying there? Be a good Samaritan. When God gives you an opportunity to help someone else in their need, help them. I remember one time Robin and I were going somewhere and there was somebody out on the street, you know, we'll work for food sign. And Robin stopped and gave him $5, I believe it was. I said, you know, he's just going to take that and go buy some booze. And she said, that's between him and God. I did what God led me to do. So you can't really always question everything you do as to whether or not it's going to turn out the way you want it to turn out. What you have to do is do what God leads you to do. Amen. And then the last thing, true religion inspires clean living. In verse 27, and refusing to let the world corrupt you. What does that mean, the world? Put in quotation marks. What does it mean to let the world corrupt you? It's speaking of this fact. Don't take on a world view. Make sure you stick with a biblical view because if you take on a world view, you'll start taking on the characteristics of those who are unsaved. What does corrupt mean? Let me read it again. Refusing to let the world corrupt you. What does that word corrupt mean? It does not mean to become isolated. There are some people that read this and say, what that means is I'm to have have no contact with the world period, ever. No. It doesn't mean that you isolate yourself. How can we be salt to this world if we isolate ourselves from the world? But it does mean you're supposed to be insulated. What does that mean? It's okay for a ship to be in the water, right? But when the water gets in the ship, then you got a problem. So it's okay for you as a believer to be in the world, but not of the world. Don't let the worldly waters get into your ship of salvation is what he's saying. So don't allow this world to contaminate the life that God has called you to. During a revival, a worldly church member walked over to a lost man during the invitation and asked, would you like to become a Christian? That lost man looked at him and he said, you've got a lot of nerve, you've got a lot of gall to ask me if I want to be a Christian like you. Because of you, I started drinking because I saw you drink. Because I saw you gambling, I started gambling. Because I saw you in a bar, I started hanging out at bars. He went on to say that I almost lost my marriage and my home and my job because of you. You are the last person on earth that ought to ask me to become a Christian. And that Christian who had asked him if he wanted to become a Christian hung his head and he walked away. And then a dear old saint in the Lord, a woman who'd been walking with Jesus for a long time and this man knew of her life. She walked over to him with tears running down her cheeks. And after a while she said, wouldn't you like to give your heart to Christ? And that man bowed his head and he was gloriously born again. His name was Charles Kittredge. Probably doesn't ring a bell for most. 
But he and four other men formed a little organization called the Gideons. Have you ever heard of them? With their mission to put a Bible in every hotel room in the world. There's no telling how many thousands of people have been comforted by that word of God that they found in a nightstand in their hotel room or gave their heart to Christ. I've heard many testimonies of people who said, I just opened up the nightstand, there was a Bible, I started reading it and gave my heart to Christ. Now here's the point I want you to understand. She went to the lost man in tears. The world of Christian went to the lost man with a horrible reputation. He didn't get saved because someone said you ought to get saved. This man got saved because somebody's religion was real. Her religion was real. And he knew how she had lived her life. How we live matters. So let's all walk the talk.